Hello, my lovely rose garden, and welcome to a cathartic review. I'm Avalon Rosalind, indie author and your Cabin 6 counselor for the evening. Like many Percy Jackson fans who are obsessed with Nico D'Angelo, I was ecstatic when I heard that our favorite grumpy ball of darkness would be getting a focus book of his own in the Percy Jackson series. Admittedly, I had somewhat fallen off of the PJO train for a few years due to other things taking priority in my life. I wasn't the biggest fan of Heroes of Olympus, and wasn't immediately taken with Trials of Apollo, though I may give it another chance because I foolishly overlooked the fact that there would probably be more Nico content in that series. Because, well, that kind of has been the thing. Nico is often a very important side character, but almost always just a side character. He will show up for a few scenes, and then he's gone into the shadows again. The Sun and the Star is a whole book dedicated to Nico. Yes, Will also has perspective chapters, but it is clear that Nico is the star of this book, and it is about him, even when Will is the narrator. As someone who was a diehard Persico shipper, I will admit that it took me a little time to warm up to Solangelo, but there is room for many ships within my heart. Percy and Nico both have two hands, and I like both Annabeth and Will as characters too. Potentially controversial take here, but I really get annoyed when people feel the need to bash another ship to promote their own. Are Annabeth and Will perfect characters who never make mistakes in their romantic pursuits? No, but neither are Percy and Nico. These are traumatized teenagers. They're going to mess up. They are messes, generally. And when it comes to the sun and the star, I appreciated the honesty of that in the exploration of Nico and Will's relationship. Before I get carried away, let me back up a bit and talk about a few differences between The Sun and the Star and other Percy Jackson books. The Sun and the Star was co-written by Rick Riordan, he, him, and Mark Oshiro, they, them. Once again, I have to appreciate Riordan working with marginalized authors to bring authenticity to his characters. He may not always get it 100% correct, but he is trying. The way they collaborated is also somewhat unique to me. Oshiro wrote the first draft, Riordan wrote the second, and then they worked back and forth until the book was finished and they did not definitively know who wrote what. The book is unified in voice and tone throughout, with alternating third-person perspectives between Nico and Will, which was one of the things I didn't love about Heroes of Olympus, but works much better here in my opinion, since the reader is following two characters who are on the same quest rather than jumping around between A, B, and sometimes C plots. The Sun and the Star is set after Trials of Apollo, and for a moment I worried that I wouldn't be able to follow everything in the plot since I haven't read it. But while I'm sure there are parts that would have had more significance if I had, I was able to understand everything that happened and meeting characters that were new to me, but not to Nico and Will. It was a little like catching up with a friend that I hadn't seen in a while. Maybe I wasn't there for a few of those adventures, but I enjoyed hearing about them all the same, and it made me interested in actually reading Trials of Apollo. I really hope that after this, Nico and Will are able to get a nice break to enjoy each other's company and work on taming some of Nico's demons. Uh, but we'll get to that. The plot of the sun and the star follows Nico returning to Tartarus, the hellish section of the underworld that he already braved once in Heroes of Olympus, to free Bob the Titan from his unjust confinement there. Oh, and this is where new readers will actually need some background information? Bob the Titan is actually Iepetus, who was dunked into the river Lethe and lost his memories in the side story Sword of Hades from the Demigod Files. Newly named Bob, he becomes a custodian in Hades' employ until circumstances in Heroes of Olympus force him to go into Tartarus to rescue Percy and Annabeth. He was left behind there afterward, and Nico feels really, really guilty about it, especially once he starts having horrific nightmares and hearing Bob calling out for help from the depths of hell. 
it becomes too much to ignore, especially when Nico finds himself almost enjoying a peaceful life for a change, and he plunges back into Tartarus with Will at his side to rescue the Titan who has proved himself to be one of the greatest allies a demigod could have. What the book is really about is Nico facing his trauma and beginning to overcome it, as well as working through his relationship issues with Will. While Will and Nico are definitely not unhealthy in any significant way, they are both traumatized kids who are navigating their first serious relationship and also trying to get their own issues sorted out. Nico more so than Will, but Will is not without his own troubles. He is still a demigod who has lived through the same three wars that Nico has and has watched his siblings and fellow campers die, some of them under his care as a medic. And Nico is, well, Nico. He's a child of the underworld, dating the son of Apollo, and his fears that Will won't understand the sight of him is not unwarranted. At the same time, Will's hesitation toward the underworld is also not unwarranted. It is literally the furthest away he can be from his source of power, and it has a drastically negative impact on him. Despite this, despite everything, they love each other and want to be together. I really and truly do not understand a lot of the complaints that I saw about this book or the main couple in it. Yes, Will does not understand Nico. He will never completely understand Nico. That doesn't make him a bad boyfriend. Unless you and your partner have had literally all of the exact same experiences, you will never completely understand them. Will still tries to relate to Nico, to care for him, to give him space to vent and speak his feelings, even if he doesn't always share them or fully get where Nico is coming from. And this is also while they are suffering from the effects of literal nightmare demons and the living, hateful landscape of ancient Greek hell. Tartarus pushed Percy and Annabeth to their limits. It's a little unrealistic to expect that Will and Nico would be nothing but sunshine and roses on their own trek through it, into what is most definitely a trap, with a prophecy hanging over their heads that all but confirms that one of them is going to be left behind in Tartarus. The only thing that I didn't super love about the book was the flash-forwarding to Gorgira. I feel like that might have been a better choice if Gorgira was one of the final encounters Nico and Will had in the Underworld, since that way these little snippets would have been present through the entire book and could have served as more of a framing device for the whole quest. As it is, they feel a little out of place and could have been compiled into a chapter or two near the middle of the book where the Gorgia encounter organically occurs in the narrative. Another positive in the book's favor, which I mentioned in my quick review, is the fact that Tartarus continues to be unrelenting. I was worried that since Nico has been to Tartarus before in Heroes of Olympus, it would start to feel like less of a dire situation, especially since the reader has already been treated to a pretty in-depth view of the place during Percy and Annabeth's parts of House of Hades. But no. Tartarus is oppressive and dangerous and grueling to get through. Even getting to Tartarus in the Sun and the Star is a whole ordeal, with foes and obstacles blocking Nico and Will's progress so often. I actually felt relieved when Nico and Will finally got to Tartarus, until I remembered where they were, and everything got worse from there. It is hell, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally too. There were times, just like when I read House of Hades, that I wasn't sure that characters would be able to make it out. I think that this is going to be where I get into spoilers, so if you are leaving the review now, first of all, thank you for listening, and leave me a skull emoji for Nico or a sun emoji for Will, depending on if you like the grumpy ball of darkness type more or the sunshine golden retriever type more. If you are leaving the video now, please remember to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. I make videos about the books I read and the books I write, and your support really makes a difference for an indie author like me. If you're interested in supporting me even further, please consider buying my books or becoming a patron. 
you can find the links to my website, Patreon, Ko-fi, and social media accounts in the description. So, Hades might have ruined my brain a little, because I will never be able to view the Chthonic gods the same way after playing that. It is hard to see Nyx as anything other than Mother Night, you know? But I am glad that she got some focus, as well as many of her children, most notably Hypnos and Nemesis, who have been mentioned and made a few appearances in other Percy Jackson books, too. Nyx in The Sun and the Star is terrifying, because of how perfect of a villain foil she is to Nico. She isn't trying to overthrow Olympus, she doesn't want to rule the world. She just wants Nico to suffer. Not for any personal reason either, really. She just thinks that Nico is defined by his pain and trauma, that it is quintessentially who he is. She actually serves as a really great metaphor for the darkness that Nico has been carrying around inside of him for his whole life, and confronting her is also his way of confronting all those parts of him that he worries make him unlovable to someone like Will. I do not know if I can put into words my reaction to the Coco Demons. Sorry, Coco Puffs. Like, wow. Will hits the nail on the head with his reaction of revulsion over what Nyx did to Nico by taking his traumas and giving them physical form. And I don't know if this is just my reading of it or if other people also got these vibes, but the fact that she refers to Nico as their father and herself as their mother unsettled me to a degree that I did not expect. When that is coupled with the flashback of Nico's first visit to Tartarus and encounter with Nyx at the time, there is subtext there that makes this so, so much worse. And then Nico reacts by accepting them, setting them free, naming them Coco Puffs. He is surprised when they want to come with him out of Tartarus and sort of become his pets. I've seen a few critiques of this as diminishing or oo-woo-ifying Nico's trauma, but I don't think that's the message at all. The point is that Nico is making the choice to release his trauma instead of bottling it up inside and letting it tear him apart anymore. When the Coco Puffs decide to follow him, it is to show that these things will always be a part of Nico, but they don't have to be scary or hidden away or never talked about. He can learn to live with his trauma and pain in a healthy way, and Will is right there beside him, not scared off, but accepting. Thankfully, this does not result in a talking the villain to death ending, which I don't think would necessarily fit in a book like this. There is plenty of action and fighting. Ultimately, though, it takes both Nico accepting his darkness and the support network he has built, working together to get him, Will, and Bob out of Tartarus as Nyx launches her final desperate attack. The final scenes at the end. Nico getting to see his sister and mom one last time, having a moment with Hades, and being able to reach out to Piper to discuss their shared grief over Jason. How else can someone feel after reading that but hopeful that it only gets better from here? This book was beautiful. It made me emotional, and I think all those posts asking for queer relationships in young adult media, or media in general, that aren't scrubbed clean of conflict, that are allowed to be complicated and messy without going so far as to be abusive to show gay couples as people who need to learn to communicate just like any couple does. The Sun and the Star is that book, and it just so happens to also be one of my favorite fictional characters of all time finally getting his happy ever after. I couldn't have asked for more, and this book may have taken the Titan's Curse place as my favorite book in the Percy Jackson series. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Add a black heart emoji to your comment if you made it this far, and tell me, have you read The Sun and the Star? And if you haven't, why not? Go do it. You'll be glad you did.
Thank you so much for watching, and a special thank you to my patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or in the description below, please consider joining my Patreon. Your support means so much to me and allows me to continue making content. If you want to support my content in different ways, consider buying my books, donating on coffee, subscribing to the channel, or even just giving this video a like and comment. Any and everything is appreciated so much. Keep growing till next time, Rose Garden!